Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to Ask the Expert from BC Training. Um, today, uh, we're talking about cyber risk assessment uh, and the webinar will be presented by Charlie McLean Bristol, Director of BC Training and Plan B Consulting. For those of you who may not know, Charlie has written a course on managing and preparing for cyber incidents. If you don't like any further information, get in touch with uh, the team back at BC Training HQ. If you'd like to ask Charlie any questions during the, webinar, uh, during the webinar, please do so by typing in the question box on the control panel to the right of your screen. The webinar will last a maximum of an hour, and later on today, we will email a copy of the webinar over to you, and the recording will be available on our website, along with all our previous webinars. Information about our next webinar will be released in due course once the presenter and subject have been confirmed. So. Today, we are covering cyber risk assessment. Charlie is a panelist, so I'll hand you over to him. All right, so I'm um, just waiting for the, the joy of technical bit here. Right, show my screen, show my screen. There we are. So, good. So, um, yeah, cyber risk assessment. What I've trying to go on today for is a little bit of a niche piece of cyber. So it's not a sort of general cyber cyber talk about all the different risks I'm here. Um, but I think it's... Uh, yeah. Is that all right? Um, it is not a, it's not a gen, this is not about general cyber risk assessment, but quite a niche piece of cyber risk assessment, which... Um, I've given this sort of talk to a number of people at my cyber courses, and um, it's something new for them. So what I want to do is share that with you today. Just to introduce um, myself, Charlie McLean Bristol. I'm a fellow of the Business Continuity Institute. My own background is Army, Angley Water, Scottish Power, and then, um, as Sam Lachlan said, I'm... Um, a director of Plan B Consults and a director of business continuity training. I think the important bit to know, those of you who don't know me, from my background is I do not have a technical background at all. So that if you, um, if I need to try and stop the cyber guys getting in through port 21, I wouldn't even know where to start. So this is very much designed as a kind of business continuity practitioners type of talk rather than the technical ends there. So that's me there. I think the first thing, and this is actually pretty relevant to what I'm talking about today, is that there is no such thing as absolute security. So, and if there was, we couldn't afford it. So I think the first bit is to say is to say, and depending on your level of risk and depending on your level of preparation, is that if they want it, they will get it, and it really just depends a little bit upon um, how do, how good your defence is. But if the um, I won't name any countries, but um, if a sort of state actor wants your files or wants your IP or what else you get, you have to have some pretty serious um, cybersecurity to pre prevent them getting it. So my, my, my talk here is rather relevant to that point is to say, you know, we can all be hacked. It just matters upon who's doing it. And, you know, you might have set the bar very high, but I think if, you know, if a government wants to do it, for most people, they can probably get it if they, if they want. So there's no such thing as absolute security is my basic bottom line here. Um, so what I could do is, is I'll talk about the background case studies and then get a little bit into what this risk assessment looks at. And I want to just do a couple of case studies here, short case studies, really because what happened in these case study is relevant to our talks. So I think we all know or remember the Sony hack 20, 24, 2010. The basic key point here was the people who did the hack 
And I think that I think you know if you read the news, they they put this down to North Korea, is they spent two months copying critical files. So one of the key bits about this risk assessment is understanding if they are in your systems for two months copying critical files, what does that look like? I think the other key bit was here is they release released sensitive emails. So in terms of Sony um, films, and if I remember rightly, there was lots of emails going backwards and forwards about um, senior producers saying this person's being paid too much and this actress is not as beautiful as she thinks she is, and lots of stuff going backwards and forwards, which the the people who sent those emails never expected them to, to, to come out. So there was lots of sensitive stuff in those emails, personal stuff, where it was released and caused embarrassment to those that um, sent the emails. And, you know, if um, the, the film business is full of big egos, and if you're a an actor or an actress, and someone thinks they're being nice to your face and then they're, they're um, slating you behind your back, that destroys the relationship. And once you've, that relationship is destroyed, it's actually very, very difficult to get that back, that back again. I think there's an interesting one here is before we've done a lot of sort of ransomware which has locked your files out, Sony, the, the guys, the hackers there went in for data destruction. So they went in for actually trashing trashing your data. So we had to be slightly minded of that actually someone might be going in to just try and destroy our data. And if they're in for two months, how much damage can they do? So a bit of denial of service, lots of reputational damage. There's a long litany of sacking of senior executives as this happens. So I think, you know, if you're wanting to use some leverage on your senior managers, you need to get, I've got a bit of a rogues gallery, of people who were sacked after this. So this is a key bit of where your senior managers have to resign or get sacked because of this. So it's in their best interest. And you can see that set aside 15 million to deal with the damages. If you look at some of the more recent ones like um, Maersk or um, some of the other people that got hit by the some of the more recent viruses, the, the, the money put aside for that was greatly in um, round about that deal. So that's actually looks quite cheap. So that's Sony. The next one, the Ashley Mays Madison here. I'm not asking anyone their questions if they signed up for this. But basically, what the hackers stole here was all of the customer data. So names, you, well, you can read there. Credit card information, um, sexual fantasies. So that's what you put on this site. This is a site where you signed up there if you wanted to have an affair. And this led to extortion emails. So, um, you know, once you got that information, then people were threatened, say, I'm going to tell your wife, and I'm going to tell her this is your fantasy, and I'm going to tell her that, um, you know, you've been signed up for this site to try and um, have an affair. And there was at least one suicide. And I think it's not quite to do with risk assessment, but we need to take into account the, the human impact. You know, sometimes you think, oh, just been hacked. And yeah, it's very sad. But um, this it does have an actual human interaction. So we've got at least one suicide there. And so there is a human impact. You know, if you lose all your staff data, your staff are going to spend a lot of time trying to sort this out. They lose, um, they lose faith in the company. So I think we need to always be careful is to say this is not just about IT. This is about people. And it does have a big impact on people. So we mustn't forget that. We sometimes think maybe it's all about data, IT, and no, in the end, it is. this is people's data, and it has an effect to them. So there's a couple of relevant case studies, and I want to come back to them. I'll mention them as I go, uh, go along. My next point here is, for some organizations, you know, there's a large spectrum of different attacks, and ransomware is there, and phishing and all this sort of stuff is the kind of... Um, 
the flavor at the moment. But I think if you look at if you look at my top one, so um, I think that top one is um, 2015. That the hackers, on average, when they've been found, once they've got inside your systems, is 200 plus days before their discovery. Now, in um, Trustwave, I was looking at their um, one of their information. Um, um, booklets, which they, which is freely available on the web, that decreased to 49 days. So the amount of time is going down, and you look at a few different references, and different people have different times, but it doesn't really matter too much. It seems to me that if someone is going to be in your systems for a reasonable amount of time, they have a reasonable amount of time to find what they're looking for, or to have a good rummage around and see what is in there. So I think, again, this is pointing me to say is to say that if they're going to be in there for a reasonable amount of time, they will have time to find what they're looking for. And we need to be um, ready for that. So one of my points is they're going to be in for a while. Um, this was, again, from the, the trust wave here is the method of detection and if you can see there that almost 50 percent of the method of detection has come from our regulatory bodies card brands and merchant banks whereas 43 is self-detected so what you have the difficulty is here is that if someone suddenly comes to you, rings up your front desk or sends a policeman round or sends a man, woman round to say, look, you've been hacked, you're immediately, that is your sort of hour zero of finding what has been done, how has it been done to you. And also this is your hour zero from when um, you have to report the, the, the breach. Now, under existing laws and the um, Information Commissioner's Office, at the moment you're, a, you're under pressure or should be reporting breaches, but you don't actually have to by law. When GD, GDPR comes in in um, the not too far distant future, then you're going to have 72 hours to report breaches. So in terms of the reporting, you're in a bit of a dilemma here because you're really up against the clock in the fact is that someone else externally finds it. So you haven't even got a bit of time to say, we think there might be someone, we can do some more investigations before we're sure, but we perhaps don't need to start the clock until we definitely know someone's done it. Whereas if you, if you actually say the 50% is going to come out from elsewhere, that is when your clock starts. And then in GDPR, you've got three days to do something about it. So... The point is here is you're suddenly going to be hacked or told you've been hacked and you need to understand what that means. And what, what my sort of purpose is here is to try and persuade you to have a look at to say, what have you got to lose? So you need to do a kind of a digital inventory of what you've got there. And you need to know is what if they got the lot? So if they've been in for 50 days, you know, some will be in for longer, some will be in for less, then there is a high chance they could have got everything you have in there. So you need to very quickly understand what does that look like. And so the rest of my thing is going to have a look, a look at it is perhaps uh, find out some of the questions that you need to ask yourself in this. But my, 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 my pitch to you for this today is that you need to do this digital inventory. You need to do this inventory. You need to do what do you call it, inventory risk assessment. I'm not really sure quite what it should be called. I'm happy for anyone to, to give a, to give a, um, a name what we think it is, but we need to, you need to do this so that if 
somebody says, right, you've been hacked, and your CEO's turned around and say, what does that mean? Then you can produce an inventory and say, at worst case, this is what it is. We're hoping they haven't got into here, here, and here, but this is the worst case. And once you know your worst case, then you're not doing what Equifax is doing, and this is where you come really into trouble, is to say, oh, they got a million, a million names and addresses, and then three weeks later or two weeks later, say, ah, uh, it's actually two million, or they also got credit card numbers, or they also got this, and it makes you look incompetent because you obviously you've had to to do the once you've done looked a bit closer, you find out your initial uh, estimate wasn't as uh, was um, better than but or not as bad as you think. So I think this is the, the point is what we need to do is we need to do this digital inventory. We need to do this risk assessment. We need to understand what have they got a lot. And then we can then work backwards and say, how are we going to manage this? So the first thing we need to have a look at is to say, what information as an organization do we hold? Now, under GDPR, you might have done some of this, but actually, if you want to, you want to have a little bit look in, it's not just about the personal data, it's about the company data as well. So if we think about first thing on the top of the list there is your emails. So actually, if, if, if someone got every single email your company has sent, or your organization has sent, is the embarrassing things in there? Is there lots of information in there? Is there information in there that you wouldn't like to get out? And I think with your emails, this is a little bit of, first of all, you need to understand how you use email. So what is the sort of worst thing that could be in there? Is there lots of financial stuff? Is there lots of sensitive stuff in there? But you might also want to have a look at the tone, the style. Do people, are people in your organization sensitive about what they write in terms of slagging off people, in terms of just sort of, I'm not bullying, but just kind of talking behind people's backs, that sort of things, maybe about your customers, maybe about your suppliers, maybe about your boards, maybe your senior managers. So you need to understand, first of all, how people use email and what is the tone and style. And are people kind of quite sensitive about what they write or are they, is it a free for all? So database information there. So what are all your database? What do they contain? What is the personal information in there? And I think one of the key bits there is down to what detail of it. So is it just names and addresses? Is it names and addresses of bank accounts? Is it bank accounts and sort codes? So it's not just to say, oh, we've got a database of our customers. Well, what and that's maybe a bit more CRM systems, but actually, is it down to personal phone numbers? Is it personal e emails? Is it personal um, mobile numbers? Is it their home addresses? Because you know, maybe that's a BC information you, you keep that. So, you need to understand what's in your databases, you need to understand what's in your CRM systems, and you need to also understand this a little bit of a sort of standalone as well because if you use software as a service like salesforce then there'd be a possibility they're not going into your systems but they've got into salesforce backdoor into salesforce and then they've got your access to your data in salesforce so you need to be able to segment your systems as well and understand where the data is held. So you might say, we've got a data database here that's very sensitive, so that's got much, much more security. And we've got our kind of normal email, normal, normal um, Excel, Word, all that stuff we create. And is the different levels of security. So we can kind of say, well, we think they've only breached our, our personal data so they haven't got into our more sensitive data, which has more security. So you need to actually understand what are the different levels of security and also where that different data is kept. You know, HR databases, what do you keep on your staff? You know, we don't want to annoy all our staff. So what internal information we get, is that software as a service? 
is that internally and all your finance details as well so um you know is there lots of financial details there is the details of all the people you pay is the details of all the invoices you're expending expecting information coming in there so again understanding that understanding what's in there and doing a really good inventory of that that information so that's the first thing is understanding the information or data data you hold the next thing is and this is not going to be picked up by gdpr is about you know what do you have that others might want to steal either because actually it is the new stealth fighter for Lockheed Martin. So actually various nations would love to get their hands on how we do this technology and how we build the latest radar or how we build this latest fighter jet. So there's the kind of that end to wouldn't people, wouldn't it be fun to get the um, KFC's list of, herbs and spices and stick it on the internet just for a bit of fun to say oh there's a secret recipe but it's not secret anymore so there's different levels of it so we need to understand what do we hold in the terms of intellectual property what do we hold this is our kind of this is a bit of a some of our rivals the sort of idea of the crown jewels what is what, what is the really important to you so what do you hold in intellectual property you know do you have recipes for making things i'm not just thinking food Maybe. Thinking of making up different, um, different. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's chemicals, um, blueprints, formulas, source codes for your software. You know, maybe someone gets into your escrow account and get the source code for your for your app or your software there. So again, you need to do that inventory of of those and understand what you have and understand what the value of that is. Uh, BCT people, I think someone's got a microphone on. Um, anyway, so it's again, it's an inventory and understanding the worth of those things. And perhaps as part of the risk assessment, understanding the level of um, security on them. But again, another inventory there. And how are these things hold? Always, actually, the recipe for KFCs, however many herbs and spices he's got, is actually kept in a safe. And actually, um, in terms of cyber security, you can't physically get it like that because it doesn't actually exist electronically. So we need to understand that. I think if you look at, um, I was looking at that trust wave thing last couple of days. And it seems the most things that hackers are after, one of the big things they're after, is credit card information, stuff you can make money out of. Yeah, we, we might want to steal the KFC recipe, but actually, and are, are you know, KFC's um, rivals really even are going to buy that off you to get it? They probably they may, but probably not so to me that the criminals are more interested in making fast money so what data have you been expecting for financial gain so you know is it your business strategies or your financial information so somebody can actually use that to start playing on the stock market with insider information negotiating information business plans so those are those are the things things that takes more level of sophistication to be able to work out the impact of them but then we can get down down to the more the more sort of basic stuff is invoicing a customer's details and you know there's a classic case I was hearing of um, a company that did private jets so you you hire them to do private jets and um, the company that actually moved moved the passengers sent them an invoice for a hundred thousand pounds um, the company paid the invoice and the company who sent the invoice, then came back about a month later and said, why haven't you paid my invoice? And they said, oh, we did. And they said, um, but you just changed your bank account details the last minute, and then the penny drops. And that's a reasonable, well-known fraud. And what the, 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 the company has got into your systems, they've got access to all your systems. What they do is work out how your invoicing works. They kind of target the right people. that They know that this big invoice is going to come in, and then they can intercept it, change the bank account details, and then the money goes to them, and they've got £100,000 or 
whatever much this amount is. So it's understanding that and understanding how our systems work and also, you know, what level of security is there and how difficult that is. You know, there's one of the biggest things that people are after if hacking is your credit card numbers, your bank details. Um, credit card numbers getting a bit more hard to get, but people still have them, and that's what people are after. That you know the um, the hackers are after. So anything you can do to financial fraud, and so you need to understand if you do credit card transactions, what is your level of risk to, to or threat to, to to this? Are you very well tightly down? So you can say actually yes, of course we do credit cards, but we don't keep all the numbers they're held securely so we think it's highly unlikely they've got the credit card numbers or it's impossible to get the credit card numbers because we only hold part of them and then what level of um, data do you hold so in terms of bank and bank information do you hold pin numbers say do you hold in the numbers to get access to your bank accounts so you need to add the detail what I just said with credit cards is understand do we hold the whole number do we hold the um expiry date do we hold the, the cb whatever the number is on the back do we hold that number or do we just hold part of the credit card number or and all this is the detail you need to know because if if your ceo is going to stand up to the press and be asked a question you don't want to be he doesn't want to be or she doesn't want to be sort of scrabbling around trying to find this information last minute this information needs to be really available up front so commercial fraud um in terms of reputation this is where we go back to sony and say you know ask the question what's the most embarrassing bit of information we hold so actually if they say you got the lot what does that mean so yeah how do you use email? Are there been investigations of, you know, well-known people in the company that, you know, business people can be household names. So is there investigations into them? Have, you know, have they been bullying? It may be an internal investigation, but or sexual harassment is the kind of um, thing of the moment. So is that that it may have been lots of complaints against this person and it's not been properly investigated or whatever so you know that gets out and then this causes a huge amount of um reputation embarrassment for your company so any investigation salaries you know people are very sensitive about salaries why is he getting paid more than her and vice versa and so that can cause a massive you know impact in your organization you say all oh, the salaries reduces have there been cover-ups have you been covering up stuff have you not told information there um are the reports that have been suppressed so i think it is you know you you you're you're as an organization you need to be honest with yourself and say look what's the most embarrassing thing we hold what is what do we have in there what are the skeletons in the cupboard you know, we can hold all this information sensitively about, you know, we don't want to go and everyone knowing that we've had some cover ups or sort of shelled a few investigations or whatever. But the CEO needs to go in there and say, look, this is the worst case. Once we know the worst case, they don't, you don't need to release everything unless you have to. But at least, you know, this is, this is as far as we can go. And I think you also need to understand is how can this be impact our operations? Now, if you look at that thing to the right, attack in Saudi Arabia, deadly goal, this is just something I picked up in the New, um, New York Times um, yesterday was someone had tried to hack um, a chemical factory in Saudi and then they think that the way they did the hacks, they hacked into the operation, was trying to make the thing explode. Now, if you look at the, some of the impact in um, Ukraine, where um, allegedly Russian hackers have tried to take down or had a big impact on the national grid, or you look at the Stuknet thing where the Israelis are trying to, or the Israelis, the Americans, allegedly, I'll say that, um, tried to sabotage the Iranian um, nuclear um, enrichment. 
we now know that you know operations and our, our um, SCADA system are vulnerable to here. And if you're clever and really have a good knowledge of this, you can actually start playing around tunes on the on the um, operations of a plant, and you can either cause pollution, you can close it down, you can try and cause it to explode. So I think again we need to understand, um, you know, how can our operations be sabotaged? So, you know, they might have not, they might have got into your systems and actually they might not have caused the sabotage, but they might be waiting for the right moment to do it. So almost, you know, governments might say, actually, we'll infiltrate the UK water system or the water industry. We're not going to start, doing anything bad now but we know how to do it or we put the the software and the back doors and everything in place so we know as soon as that happens if we have a need to we can sabotage it straight away we can close down the water system we can cause massive amounts of damage and we need to understand that so sabotage operations your internet of things so your connectivity to the internet everything from your lifts to your um air conditioning systems so that's just in your building you don't need to run a huge big petrochemical plant to have your your buildings connected to um connected to the the, the web and then that has the ability to, to to be hacked there maybe you've got your supply chain is done just in time or your supply chain is dynamically managed so that you know when it get when you get down to three widgets left in the store, you book out that widget, the, the the fourth last widget, and it automatically then goes and tells your your supplier to replenish um, widgets. So again, all that sort of stuff now can happen without human interaction. The computer knows what the stock is there and they know to when to replenish it. But if that is not done or your system is interrupted in some way, then you need to understand, have they changed the parameters in there? Are they making us order 20 times more widgets because that's going to really cause us lots of money and block up the stores? Or actually, could they get into us? Could they stop it if they want to do? And then our impact on processes when we've got SCADA controlled factories, refineries, transport systems, all the government systems there. So, you know, this is another big bit of um, another bit, bit of um, looking, looking at understanding your vulnerabilities and what you don't want to do is be, as I said, lots of times, scrabbling around for the day, trying to say, oh, is this at risk? Is my building at risk? I've never thought about, actually, is our refinery at risk? So we need to understand these days and we need to do the risk assessment up front. So my kind of conclusion here is, hopefully I've sold this idea to you, but do an inventory now. So go through all your stuff you've got and actually understand it and understand it in detail. You know, how many actual credit card numbers do we hold? How many, cust how many items in our CRM system? So you actually get down to detail. So if you say, right, they got the lot, we've actually lost um, 10,000 customer details or 20,000 or 10 million or whatever that number is, because you need to know that number quick. And if you change it, then it's going to have a big impact. And understand that value to others. So it's not what that value to you is, understand that it's value to others. So, you know, some hackers are more interested in making money, Others may be more interested in making a point. So what is what is that value of that information to others? Um, I think this is a sort of the, maybe the next step on for this is understand the details of the protection. So understand how you're protecting these things. And actually, once you understand and done your inventory, then you need to a little bit look back again and go and say, do we need to 
get further protection on these things because actually these are our crown jewels and these are the things that we, we don't want to go. And if this goes, we've had it. Understand what your worst case is. So understand they got the lot. What does that look like? And hopefully they haven't got it all or haven't got very much, but you need to make sure that is done. I think the next thing is to do, and this is getting a little bit on from our risk assessment, is have your communications ready to go. So if we understand who's got the lot, we understand what that is, then actually to think, start thinking about, well, we've got 100,000 staff. So how are we going to communicate with staff if we've lost all their details? So have we got the number? Have we got the collateral? Do we know how to do that? Or if we've got an RCRM system, if we've got, I don't know, 10,000 customer details and people's details, do we understand how to communicate with them, how to get hold of them, and how to tell them that um, their, their personal details may be compromised? So you need to start thinking about once we've got we know what we've got to lose then we need to say to do a sort of stakeholder map off that and then we need to actually start thinking about well actually if we want to write to all our write to all our customers or all our suppliers can we actually can we actually do that so you know all those things have to have to be done and it's all part of your preparation and then my last bit is to say, what can you do in response to the loss? So what I'm saying here is to say, if you lose all your staff data, what can you do to help protect your staff? Well, it's too late to now to put extra controls in here. So you're dealing with the response. Now, Equifax put um, in a system where you can look up to see whether um, someone's taken out a loan in your name or people are trying to use your data for financial fraud. That's, you know, almost like the standard way you can do is to protect your own staff or protect anybody who has their data loss. Now, I don't think you want to be scrambling around on the day and trying to say, get on the internet and see if you can find a company that does this and how does it work and how long does it take? And um, I think you need to have in place that contingency plan maybe you need to pay a retainer maybe you just need to understand what that looks like but what i would expect people to do is to say right we lost all our staff data we've got this policy in place or we've got this plan in place which says we'll provide credit checking for them here's the system here's the website all we need to do is you know pay the money ask the company to sort it out and we can get that going up in 12 hours really good response one less thing to do and we've um you know if your data's out there your data's out there you you can't put the horse back in the stable but at least what you can do is you know you've got your mitigation plans in place so and then and that's why you need to work through all those different um data levels of data to understand what it means and then just understand how you can mitigate them if you can you know there might be certain things like your email is just to say well if they've gone they're gone and someone sits through them all find embarrassing things well it is what it is but i think you need to understand what you're going to do in response to that so that is my talk is a sort of slightly plea and i'm not sure how many other people are pushing this this thing so thanks very much for listening is there any questions there have i stunned you all into silence there Hi. Um, no, I think uh, I think uh, we've got no questions to answer now. So um, I suspect people will email in questions afterwards, like they tend to normally. All right, that's fine. So um, should we just give it a couple of more minutes? There's no questions there. We'll sign off and um, hope you all enjoy your weekend. Any feedback, um, good or bad, or any thoughts, just um, email us or get hold of us, and um, greatly appreciated. 
Okay, um, brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Charlie. Really interesting. Um, I think we've got a great insight into cyber risk assessment, um, and I hope that everyone else enjoyed it as much as, as we did. Um, thank you to all those that attended and listened in. Um, it's nice to see you all there. There's quite a few people come in today, so that's good. A few familiar faces. Um, we'll be sending over a copy of today's uh, bulletin as a web, uh, sorry, today's webinar as the bulletin in case you missed out on any of the content that was covered. As I mentioned earlier, Charlie has written a Managing and Preparing for Cyber Incidents course, which ran successfully earlier this month. If you'd like further information about our upcoming courses, give us a call in the office or email or on the on online chat. If you have any feedback on this webinar or any other topics that you'd like covered in future webinars, please just reply to any of the emails you've received from us. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our future webinars. And have a great weekend. Goodbye.